Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, but a little bit chilly and windy. April day feels more like February <coughs> down here in this undisclosed swamp. In my secret garden, I am back hiding out in my secret garden from the big crowd at the hip camp, which we'll talk about in a minute. It is now a gorgeous Saturday afternoon. It is uh, April 3rd, 2021. So uh, I've been enjoying this morning reading all of uh, my various diagnoses for my vertigo and tinnitus. Uh, which I have to say, the vertigo was not quite as bad this morning, but it is, um, it's not going away. It's not as bad, but staying a lot longer. So, what have I gotten here? Uh, of course, chemtrails. We have chemtrails. We have, uh, I think, Wi-Fi poisoning. Uh, we have, I'm getting ready to have a stroke diagnosis. We have, uh, oh, Lyme's disease, and that is certainly a contender. And, uh, some illusions were made that I might have corona panic. And I have to say, I'm, I'm actually leaning towards that last one. I'm wondering, do I finally have corona panic? You know, I've had this <clears throat> shit now for going on three weeks, started out in, in my throat, in my nose, and then it moved down into my chest where it's been lodged for close to two weeks now, and now it's going back up into my ears. I've pretty much isolated that this is a problem with some sort of fluid buildup in my ears. Uh, I can actually clench my jaw and turn the uh, and turn the grasshoppers into this very high-pitched tone back in the back of my ear. And I feel a growing pressure from inside on my eardrum so I'm having some sort of fluid building up in my in my inner ear and my chest and so who knows maybe I really do have corona panic but uh, I'm just riding it out hiding here in my uh, <laughs> hiding out in my secret garden on this beautiful Saturday so, uh, I don't know, you guys can uh, decide if this has anything to do with the collapse of a planet. I've actually, I'm thinking about, whoa, I'm thinking about starting yet another YouTube channel when I get back to New York and open up the Bugs in a Jar uh, hip camp. The, the Woofer Organic Farm, the Hip Camp, what other manifestations of bugs in a jar I can come up with this summer. Just basically inviting anyone to come hang out at Bugs in a Jar and see what happens when we shake up a bunch of people. So what I'm actually going to do is just open up <clears throat> my channel to uh, anyone who wants to come on and you know, like tell their story, uh, whether it's the people working there at Bugs in a Jar, whether it's people at the hip camp, <clears throat> whatever is part of the chronicling the Bugs in a Jar. I, I simply gonna d just invite anyone who, uh, who feels like joining this conversation just to come on and, and give us their story about you know, what their life looks like uh, in the summer of 2021, uh, just to chronicle a, and I just think it would be an interesting little snapshot, uh, so I don't have to keep telling you the stories behind people's backs, they can tell them yourself, so anyway, we have an interesting collection at 
we have a full complement at Crazy Crane Campground, and uh, <clears throat> so where to start? We're we're going to start with these two guys who showed up at 11 o'clock last night and left at 9 o'clock this morning. So these guys, <clears throat> uh, one, one of these I really wanted to get get him on video. The guy, he, uh, I don't know what he's trying to strike in his, in his wardrobe. He, I guess he's probably hangs out at Renaissance fairs. So anyway, so, this dude from the, the main guy, he's from North Carolina. We've had a lot of people from North Carolina. So this fellow, what he does is he raises and breeds Nigerian dwarf goats. Nigerian dwarf goats. And there's something going on in the DNA of Nigerian dwarf goats the the subject was way too arcane for me to listen to around a campfire at midnight last night but anyway he has gotten a line on this goat in brooksville florida which is about a half hour from crazy crane and he found this goat on craigslist for three hundred dollars and somehow he has it in his mind that this is some sort of prize stud billy goat that he figures this goat is worth about fifteen thousand dollars there's something special about it and this guy has done unbelievable research so all of his research has led this man to believe that he has scored a fifteen thousand dollar stud nor Norwegian Nigerian uh, billy goat for 300 bucks so he found this thing on Craigslist and jumped in his truck in uh, North Carolina yesterday drove all the way here and North Car from North Carolina <clears throat> I guess right about now I guess he's already thrown this goat in the back of a pickup he's buying four goats he's buying the prize billy goat and three more of its relatives paying three hundred dollars a piece for these things throwing four goats in the back of his pickup truck and heading back to uh north carolina with his prize stud and i did wish him well on his billy goat adventure turning a $300 goat into a $15,000 goat and I thought I had heard about every Craigslist dream and scheme but anyway let's all wish uh, this man luck on his $15,000 billy goat for $300 and uh, so this other fellow <clears throat> uh, he was just here for a night also uh, so he's my age now, and we had uh, some interesting conversation last night. You know, of course, the corona panic came up. Well, he just got the vaccine, so he, uh, being a good little sheep, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who would get this thing. But anyway, he got the vaccine uh, just last week, and... What happened with him is he said he developed this really weird allergic rash all over his back. I'm not sure which of the vaccines he got. So he said he got the shot and, and this weird rash broke out all over his back uh, and lasted for two days. And then uh, on the third day, he woke up. The rash was gone. He feels fine. Uh, and uh, recommends I get the jab. And I just told him I'm not a friend of needles. So anyway, this dude, what he was involved in for years before the accident I will talk about is he was one of these guys who demolished old buildings. He was a demolition guy you know when you need to blow up an old building and 
preferably have it fall into its footprint uh, without knocking down the buildings on either side of it. You know, one of those guys. And so uh, I tiptoed into the story uh, of 9-11. And I said, I don't believe it. I actually have a guy who demolishes these buildings. And so I tip, of course, uh, this is the 10,000th time he has had the discussion. And according to this guy, he 100% believes the uh, mainstream media cover story. He has no problem with it whatsoever. Uh, he remembers, you know, the day that those planes hit the building and what, you know, he said to himself was they need to get those people out of here because in about one hour that building is going to collapse. Uh, and he said, according to this guy, uh, because jet fuel burning at 3,000 degrees or whatever, uh, he said there was nothing unusual about the collapse of those buildings. That uh, you could, you could, something about because it was jet fuel was so important that it, it, it didn't matter whether the, the planes, whether the explosion was in the basement or the 82nd story or wherever the hell they were, you know, he said it made no difference that the type of explosion flying a jet into the side of those buildings would have dropped after about an hour uh, of the temperature ratcheting up. It would have dropped those buildings just like it did. He saw a, it, it was a textbook, textbook example. Uh, we did not, I, I really wanted to mention Building 7 to him, but before I could find a way to tiptoe in that, uh, he told me the story, I, I guess how he got out of the building demolition business. He was working on uh, this building. He said he was six and a half stories up the side of this old building, and uh, I'm not sure what happened. He doesn't totally remember either, but something happened, and, and he f found himself falling through the air for six and a half stories, and uh, he had about three seconds to uh, get right with God, and uh, he remembers slipping and falling. I don't know why the guy didn't have a belt on or whatever. He remembers slipping and falling and uh, trying to grab at anything he could, but apparently <clears throat> what they teach you if you're, if you're you know, working in construction or destruction, I, I guess to like get in a position on your hands and knees, which I thought was pretty weird. That's how he was taught. I would think you would want to land on your feet. Obviously, you don't want to land on your uh, your head or your back. And he says the position is is like you're walking around on your hands and knees. And he said, thank God it was in December. This happened in Boston in December. And he had, you know, he was well cocooned. He, you know, he said he had on a big, thick down jacket and insulated pants and boots. So he was kind of like wrapped up in a big, thick uh, cocoon, which, which absorbed quite a bit of the shock, uh, which he credits to being alive to. And he hit that ground. It, it was solid concrete. He said he fell, he free fell for 62 feet, managed to pull himself up into that, uh, in, in, into the stand uh, on his hands and knees. And uh, he has no memory of the collision whatsoever, of course. He, he the last thing he remembers is falling through the air trying to grab uh, something uh, to, to scramble out of his fall and then he has no memory and he woke up in the hospital you know basically in a body cast and 
eight months he spent, uh, you know, lying on his back, essentially, in a body cast, thinking about his life. I asked him, I, I said, brother, I said, what the hell was going through your head for those eight months? And uh, his answer was, he was thinking about how the fuck did I get here and how the fuck did, uh, am I going to get out of here? So he's eight months before he could get out of bed, and then he spent two years. He said uh, he had to completely, it was like, I guess he had a head injury. He, he had to completely relearn how to walk and how to talk, like, you know, like he was an infant. And he had to completely, I mean, from ground up, like a, a newborn infant, he had to learn the English language all over again, and then he had to learn how to walk, and uh, obviously uh, he retired from the demolition business after that. But anyway, you've heard it from this particular, he is not a, I guess I did not ask him, I guess he is not a fan of architects and engineers for truth, and, you know, those 2,000 plus architects and engineers who uh, claim that the 9-11 cover story is unadulterated horseshit, that there is no way in hell uh, those planes brought down that building. Well, this guy begs to differ. Hell, I don't know, guys. Uh, I still am a 9-11 truther light, but I don't want to open up this whole debate uh, I do not want this channel to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, you get one comment. Osama, this includes you. Uh, Andy the Gardener, this includes you. And everybody in between Osama and Andy, you get one comment to make your comment about that guy's, uh, that demolition contractor's assessment of 9-11. So anyway, the main group I have at Crazy Crane right now. What they are, they're these five people, five people showing up in three cars. Uh, four of the five people uh, are somewhere on, you know, treading that line between overweight and obese. We have five people from like age 30 to 50 we have three dogs, three cars, and probably what looks to me like about 200 pounds of barbecue. And their sole intention of, and they're going to be here for two nights and two days, uh, is to sit here sitting in a chair around the campfire in April and, and around the grill just stuffing their face with food. Uh, stuffing their fat faces with food. That is what they're here for. That's what they're into, is sitting around uh, in, in, in these lawn chairs, uh, barbecuing and drinking beer, I guess. That is, that is how they're spending their weekend. They have absolutely no interest. You know, I was telling them about you know, where I am now about all these beautiful hiking trails. I was saying, you know, guys, you can rent my canoe, you can rent my kayak. And they were just giving me these dumb looks like, why would we want to go canoeing or kayaking and hiking when we can be sitting around here uh, in your yard uh, barbecuing and stuffing our faces and playing cornhole and uh, <clears throat> so I've been trying to, you know, like spy on them just to, you know, just get an idea of, of what five normies talk. They're from Orlando. They came up here from Orlando. And, uh, so it seems like they spend a lot of time talking about TV shows, about movies, I've heard a lot of talk about movies, a lot of talk about TV shows, a lot of talk about barbecuing, of course. Uh, you know, they're, I guess they're grill masters. 
So, uh, talking about barbecuing tricks. Uh, so I, I, I didn't want to impinge on their privacy, so I am over here. I'm just letting them have crazy crane. I, I hear we have a fire dancer coming in tonight. The woman coming in tonight is a belly dancer fire dancer where she is going to treat us you know you know these fire dancers so that is what i get to look forward to tonight and crazy crane we're going to be treated to a fire dancing show at crazy crane campground and uh <laughs> oh well i got two more weekends after this at crazy crane and then we my goal is to fire up uh, Bugs in a Jar on Friday of Memorial Day weekend is the goal to have Bugs in a Jar up and running. So uh, come see me at Bugs in a Jar and be part of the new Bugs in a Jar YouTube channel. And we're going to see what that ends up looking like. It ought to be an interesting chronicle seeing what kind of bugs show up in my jar. All right, well, get out there and enjoy your own fellow bugs in a jar being shaken up while you still can on this gorgeous spring day. Oh, is tomorrow Easter? Get out there and uh, hide your Easter eggs. Bye, guys.